it is my pleasure to welcome you all uh, at this occasion on behalf of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Cultures, the School of Philosophy, Religion and History of Science, and the Leeds University Centre for African Studies. That's a mouthful. Um, it is wonderful to have so many people uh, with us here in this room this evening, braving the weather to be part of this gathering, this celebration uh, today. It is also wonderful to have many um, people joining us online, in particular the family, relatives and friends of Professor Tendai Mangena, who are joining us from Zimbabwe. Let me try and speak a few words of Shona to make them feel included. Maneru Akanaka, Munoga Muchiwa. Does that come a little bit close? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Doesn't sound very convincing. It's a long time ago that I visited Zimbabwe and picked up a few words. My name is Adrian van Klinken and I'm a professor of religion and African studies here at Leeds. And I have the pleasure and the privilege of um, working directly with uh, Professor Mongena. It is a very unfortunate, sorry, it is a very fortunate, <laughs> notice the difference, it is a very fortunate, although seemingly unlikely, concurrence of events that has led to this gathering this evening. Unlikely, because until April 22, I didn't know Professor Mongena. On the 1st of April, she sent me an email out of the blue with a request where the Leeds could support her application to the British Academy Global Professorship Scheme. And honestly, I did wonder for a second whether it was an April's Fool's joke. <laughs> However, it turned out that she had been encouraged um, to approach Leeds with this request by a mutual colleague and friend, Professor Gibson Gube, who I believe is joining us online uh, this evening as well. And uh, Gibson had been part of the uh, Fellowship Scheme for African Academics, uh, hosted here at Leeds in the previous year. So thank you, Gibson, for making this connection. Unlikely, too, because when Tendai approached me, there were only a few weeks left before the deadline for the application. And when I asked the university's research office uh, for advice, they responded by saying, this is a hugely competitive scheme, and we haven't been very lucky with it so far. That's not very encouraging, right? And putting together a strong application takes a lot of time and, and, and effort. We decided our luck anyway, and here we are. Lastly, it is unlikely because Tendai's professorship application was supported by the School of Philosophy, Religion, and History of Science, even though she is neither a philosopher, nor a historian of science, nor a scholar of religion. Don't ask me how we made and came up with a convincing narrative in the application, but I do sometimes wonder how surprised, if not amused, Tendai must be at times to find herself in the wonderful company of religious studies and philosophy folks. So far, she hasn't run away yet. Obviously, the success of Tendai's application is a very fortunate turn of events. Fortunate because of the esteem that comes with a British Academy Global Professorship. It is a true honor for Leeds, for the faculty, for the school, for the Center of African Studies, to host the holder of such a prestigious award. However, more than academic prestige, it is fortunate because of the expertise, the insights and the connections that Sendai brings to Leeds. Her presence since February this year has already uh, allowed fascinating cross-disciplinary conversations and collaborations. Tendai has been actively participating and contributing to seminars of the uh, Center for Religion and Public Life, but also to events in the School of English, which as a literary scholar is a more natural habitat for her, and in the School of Politics and International um, politics and international studies, where she found quite a few colleagues with an interest in the social, cultural, and gender studies issues in which she is interested. Her presence here at Leeds has already resulted in another research grant application for a Marie Curie Fellowship with an applicant from Zimbabwe who she identified as a strong applicant for this scheme. This semester, Tendai has begun to deliver lectures in various modules, allowing students here at Leeds to benefit from her presence. And she has just started to supervise a newly arrived PhD student. Gloria, welcome. 
She is currently planning a series of seminars relating to her project and has joined a working group that is preparing a bit to host a large African Literature uh, Association conference here at Leeds. And it is exactly those kind of interdisciplinary cross-school conversations and contributions that make us so fortunate to host Tendai as a British Academy Global Professor. The vision and the strategy of the University of Leeds puts a big emphasis on uh, Leeds being a global institution, undertaking research and delivering students education that has a global reach and impact. Hosting scholars with the caliber and profile of Tendai is an excellent contribution to achieving this mission. Moreover, as the first black professor in the school, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, in the faculty as a whole, Tendai contributes to a much needed diversifying of the staff body at this institution. Beyond Leeds, Tendai has begun to make connections with the African Studies Association here in the UK and with the um, African Studies Network um, in Europe, convening panels at conferences of both these scholarly associations. So she is strengthening African studies, not only here at this university, but nationwide in the UK and in Europe. The much needed transformation of African studies, overcoming its colonial con legacies, decolonizing its methodologies and theories, and foregrounding the agency of African scholars to produce knowledge about the continent, is greatly helped by the meaningful presence and the critical contribution of academics like Tendai. Tendai's contribution, her presence is indeed meaningful, and her contributions are critical. But what I personally, and I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues, particularly appreciate is the way in which she is present. As we all know, academia can be a world full of big egos. Yet Tendai is warm, collegial, generous with her time, supportive and collaborative. So it is wonderful to have you, not just because you are a brilliant mind, but because you are a wonderful colleague. Before joining us here at Leeds, Tendai was an Associate Professor of Literary Studies at Great Zimbabwe University. Having received her PhD in African Literature from Leiden University in the Netherlands in 2015, she has held several prestigious research fellowships since then. This includes the Alexander von Humboldt Postdoctoral Fellowship and later a Humboldt Visiting Fellowship at the University of Bremen in Germany, and since then a Fulbright Research Fellowship at the University of California, Riverside in the USA. She has widely published in the fields of African literature, culture, and societies. She is the author of a well-received monograph, Contested Criminalities in Zimbabwean Fiction, and recently co-edited two book volumes titled The Zimbabwean Crisis After Mugabe and Cultures of Change in Contemporary Zimbabwe Political Transitions. As an accomplished scholar in African cultural studies, her interests include literature, oral history, gender, and politics. Her current research here at Leeds, which we will be learning about today, focuses on the status of single women in Zimbabwean society and the challenges they pose to African decolonial feminism. One of Tendai's more peculiar um, academic side, of, side interests is the study of names. Onamotology, I had to look it up the first time she mentioned it to me. Um, onamotology. I can't claim to be an expert in this field myself, not at all. Yet, if I am correct, the meaning of the name Tendai is be thankful. And the subtext in Shona is that this thankfulness is directed to God. Yet, I do think that today we can also direct this to Tendai herself. We are grateful to have you in our midst and to benefit as an academic, collegial community from your scholarly contributions, but above all, from your collegiality, your integrity, your humanity. So please join me all in welcoming Professor Tendai Mangena as she delivers her inaugural lecture as British Academy Global Professor of African Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds. A vote of thanks 
normally occurs at the end of uh, an event. Uh, however, for this occasion, I would disrupt that norm a bit and say, um, with heartfelt uh, gratitude and joy, I stand before you all today and I am greatly touched by your presence and support. Thank you all for attending my inaugural lecture. Um, I just hope um, I won't cry while I'm doing this, but if I do, please don't worry because where I come from, women can cry, but men should not cry. <laughs> I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to um, our esteemed dean for first uh, agreeing to support my application for the British Academy Global Professorship and then for the support afterwards. And then I also want to thank uh, our head of school, Jillian, yeah, <laughs> for the support and um, Adrian, Thank you so much for everything, but especially for organizing this event and for that beautiful introduction. In my culture, what you have done is like you have placed me at the top of the tree, the longest tree in the, in the garden. So now my, the onus is on me to make sure that I stay at that, <laughs> at that level. Thank you so much. Um, your unwavering dedication to the advancement of African scholarship and commitment to the academic community are immensely appreciated. And to my best friends and relatives, unfortunately I can't see them, but I guess they are seeing me whether following this event virtually or in person, um, I extend heartfelt thanks. Your support will always hold a special place in my heart. Uh, my academic journey has, start, uh, has taken me to Leeds, and uh, the Leeds is quite far from the place that I call home where family members uh, would typically be present for an event of this nature. Despite the distance, I'm quite grateful to have three of my maternal figures present today, uh, two here in person and uh, the other joining us online, Mama Joanna and Mama Fungai, and Secretary, your presence means a lot to me. <laughs> Maybe I need to explain to you all that Secretary is my uncle and is also a priest, but uh, at the same time, he is a husband and a mother to me. Take that as a brief introduction to the intricate social dynamics in, in my culture. Lastly, I dedicate this lecture to my father, who will be celebrating his 90th birthday on 15 January next year. My professorship is my success as it is his success. Thank you all, and um, now I, I, I begin the process of uh, maintaining the status that <laughs> Adrian has, uh, has given me. So I will begin by telling you that, um, just like what Adrian has already said, my foundational academic training was in literary studies, 
but uh, my research interests lie in the broad field of uh, African cultural studies. So in my research, I have been um, interested in the ways in which different kinds of narratives that include short stories, novels, onomastic texts, um, life, real life stories, how all these provide discursive spaces in which to think through a range of issues that include gender, sexuality, identity, migration, and politics in the specific context of post-colonial Zimbabwe. I have been able to straddle diverse disciplinary boundaries because literature by its very nature is interdisciplinary and draws on diverse fields. There are diverse ways of reading literary narratives beyond the fundamental literary language situated conceptualization of the text and reading. Literature from Africa has especially been characterized as functional. In the words of uh, Adebanui, African writers offer the kinds of abstractions, comparisons, frameworks, and critical reflections on the African life world and the place of the African in the global context. In the specific context of Zimbabwean writing, creative writers uh, have been described as the pulse of the nation in the sense that they play the role of uh, guarding against the sinking into oblivion of uh, what Kizito Mchema terms the unacknowledged, the unspoken, and unwritten traumas of Zimbabwe's history. This counter discursive feature of literature has informed my reading of Zimbabwean texts as alternative narratives of dominant stories. So in this lecture, I seek to do two things. Firstly, I wish to draw your attention to some of my major reflections on gender, gender boundaries, and gender disruptions among the Shona peoples of Zimbabwe. The Shona constitute the majority ethnic group, approximately 80% of the Zimbabwean population. Uh, these reflections are loosely drawn from my previous project with that title that you are seeing there, which was funded by the Alexander von Humboldt <coughs> and Fulbright between the years 2018 and 2020. The second thing that I seek to do is to introduce you to my current project, uh, which is the fancy title, Uncoupling Heteropatriarchy in African Feminism, Unmarried Women and Indigenous Knowledges of Gender and Sexuality Among the Shona of Zimbabwe. And this is the project that brought, brought me to Leeds in February this year. In this project, I have shifted uh, to combining ethnography and literary methods in my research. And to this end, I do at least two things. Um, I analyze Shona indigenous knowledges of women's singlehood, and uh, my frame for indigenous knowledges include African orature, Shona orature, uh, proverbs, folk tales, and then Shona sayings. And uh, through extensive field work, I also gather the lived experiences of unmarried Shona women and analyze these using critical literary methods. And because I am a literature person, I also look at uh, different texts and try to understand how they represent um, Shona singlehood 
For instance, for those that are familiar with Zimbabwean literature, we have uh, Tsidangarembwa's trilogy. Those um, three novels trace the growth of Tambudzai Sigauke, and at the end of the last uh, novel, she is not married. And then there are quite a couple of Shona novels that have unmarried women, and I want to understand how the various writers uh, understand what it means to be a Shona unmarried woman. In pursuing the, these, uh, both these objectives, I reflect on the everydayness of women's lives as sites for critical discussion on gender and sexuality, especially as these relate to the subjectivities of Shona women. I work with the dominant framing of gender as social construction of maleness and femaleness, and um, drawing on uh, Craig Callon's work, I further conceive of sexuality as the reproductive and erotic dimensions of human life, at once physical and at the same time culturally constructed. In my research, my, I focus specifically on the Shona culture of Zimbabwe, in which I am culturally located and not on Africa or even Zimbabwe in general. Speaking within a specific Shona con cultural context is a way of decolonizing what uh, the Ugandan scholar Slivia Tamale calls the reification, colonial, the colonial reification of African as a homogeneous entity. In highlighting my personal experiences as a single woman and those of other single women, in my current project, I am guided in particular by Saidia Hartman's argument that the autobiographical example is not a personal story that folds into itself. It is about trying to look at historical and social processes and one's own formation into social and historical processes as an example of them. For that reason, I consider the self-reflexive method as a form of what uh, Boylan terms doubled storytelling that moves from self to culture and back again. Evoking personal experiences in academic conversations is a method that is closely connected to feminism. The phrase, the personal is political, in particular, to quote Ari Setao, resembles a feminist slogan that raises awareness of the significance of personal stories particularly from women and other marginalized groups in society whose voices are often silenced. In privileging the voices of single women in my current project, I think through African feminism, but at the same time challenge some of its strands, I engage with the African feminism's pro heterosexual stance and the silences and yawning crevices around unmarried women who live away from and against heteronormative coupling. The project is a critical response to Tamale's argument that African feminism needs to disentangle itself from old colonial ways of thinking and doing and it specifically problematizes the implicit or explicit preoccupation with marriage, which can arguably be seen as reflecting the strong and ongoing colonial Euro-Christian Euro influence on African societies. Although marriage is highly valued in traditional African traditional cultures, colonialism and Christian missionaries introduced a much more rigid form 
norm of mono monogamous marriage as a lifelong commitment and promoted an idea of femininity in which women are domesticated as housewives and mothers who are economically dependent on the husband breadwinner. African feminism, possibly because of um, its origins in Christian women's movements, is not always adequately interrogated this norm of marriage and its impact on African women in general. So beyond um, this introductory note on methods, uh, the rest of my lecture is structured as follows. In the next section titled, Men are not women and women are not men, I draw arguments from my recent articles on gendering roles, masculinities and spaces, and uh, which was published in initially in 2018, in 2020, and then included in an issue this year. And then narratives of women in politics in Zimbabwe's recent past published last year. As I reflect, my illustrations move from everyday life experiences in politics to literary texts, then to oral tradition and popular culture. And in my view, these various uh, forms of data are useful for engaging with the social cultural realities in post-colonial Zimbabwe. Then in the remaining sections, I speak about marriage and singlehood and draw from personal experiences and on the just ended first phase of my field work in Zimbabwe. Shona patriarchy, like other forms of patriarchy elsewhere, is heteronormative in that it works on the assumption that sexes can only be divided into male and female and it finds it finds it finds it problematic when women act in ways that are socioculturally defined as manly and vice versa this heteronormative stance in zimbabwe is further perpetuated and naturalized by different types of Christianity. I, I, I don't know if there's anyone who, who has carried out a research to determine how many kinds of churches we have in Zimbabwe, but we have many churches, so many of them. And um, with the um, apostolic type, I think they break away from each other almost on a daily basis. So I don't know how many, how many, how many churches we have in Zimbabwe, but I'm saying the heteronormative stance is further perpetuated and naturalized by different types of Christianity in Zimbabwe. The statements, one is a man and not a woman, and vice versa, uh, which are popular in Shona discourses, are not only intended to articulate presumed differences between men and women, but through them Shona patriarchy creates and sustains hierarchies between men and women. The reprimand given to men, for instance, that they should not act like women unwittingly gives the false impression that men have certain ex excellencies that women do not and cannot have. At the same time, this implies that women have inadequacies that men should despise. And such social discourses uh, constitute what Hellman and Ratele elsewhere called uh, problematic constructions of gender that are reproduced in everyday contexts and sustain gender inequalities and injustices. When faced with the problem of problem of women who encroach into the spaces socially reserved for males, Shona patriarchy tends to masculinize them. 
um, arguably is, in my view, is a coping strategy. This strategy is reflected well in the Shona saying, this woman is in effect a man, which is often used to describe women who trespass into what society perceives as men's territory. Masculinizing strong women and feminizing men perceived as weak are ways that Shona Patriarch uses to sustain the myth that the typical woman has no good qualities. There are other ways besides masculinization that are put in place to deal with women who are disruptive, women who encroach into the masculinized spaces of politics, for, for example, face subtle and sometimes not so subtle forms of marginalization. The imposition of a motherly or womanly role for women politicians in Zimbabwean politics that gives on move he is part of us, speaks about in his 2020 article, is achieved in interesting ways, especially within the ruling party. I will demonstrate my argument by referring to what happened during the party's annual congress in December 2018. One of the evening, on the first evening of the Congress, some women delegates participated in a fashion show where other male and female delegates formed part of the audience and where the first lady was the guest of honor. The three winners of the fashion show were awarded a refrigerator, a four plate stove, and a microwave, respectively. And these appliances are in Zimbabwe thought as female gadgets, which women are encouraged to take pride in owning, in keeping with established gender stereotypes and domestic roles. Uh, to me, the idea of a fashion show, a beauty contest for women politicians, during what was supposed to be an important political meeting could be interpreted as a parallel performance, which had little to do with the real business of the Congress. If the National Congress brings together party leaders, men and women and youth, to make important political decisions as equals, why would women be the only ones whose bodies are made a spectacle of? and placed on display such a, during such an event. I interpret this woman, women's show performed at a political part as, a symboli as symbolic of the general political marginalization of the women's wing and its activities within the ruling party. This calls to mind the words of uh, Save Logacheni Lovu, who observes that um, at the beginning of the year 2000, the former and the late President Robert Mugabe appointed uh, what he termed a war cabinet that was supposed to be made up of Amadota civilly, shown a develop for real men, dedicated to fighting the third liberation to the end. And this example clearly shows uh, the political levels at which misogynist patriarchy is deeply entrenched in Zimbabwe. I believe that there is a connection between this desire to keep women in domesticity, even in spaces outside the domestic space of the home, and the general undervaluing of women's labor. In a short story entitled, Who Will Stop the Dark? which was published in 1980 by Charles Mugoshi, a renowned Zimbabwean writer. The narrator is taught about mouse trapping and fishing by his grandfather. And the lessons turn out to be about the qualities of real men, Varume Chaiwo in, in Shona. In the lesson about fishing, the old man uh, uses the idea of the knots and a Totally saying, in my day, 
there were women knots and men knots. A woman knot is the kind that comes apart when you tug the line. A knot with the name of whoever makes it shouldn't fall apart. A real man's knot should stay. I explain in my article entitled Gendering Rose that this lesson is as much about learning a trade as it is about gender. The old man uses the anecdote to teach the boy that to be a man means not to be a woman and how not to tie like a, a woman. The knot as an extended metaphor of work and labor suggests that women's labor is useless because uh, their knots fall apart easily. They are not ma the knots made by men are strong, suggesting that their labor is worthwhile since it is understood to be important for the survival of families. The hard labor reserved for, for men excludes domestic work in Shona and some aspects of child care. Men who do, do domestic work, especially when they are married or in the presence of their wives, are within Shona communities said to be controlled or have been given herbs intended to tame them by their wives. In my view, calling the shifting of gender roles within heterosexual coupling, the effects of husband taming herbs is, that's a strategy used by Shona Patriarchy to reinforce or naturalize traditional gender stereotypes. This apparent fixation with uh, gender boundaries is evident in supposedly mundane daily interactions and conversations. I will give the last example drawn from sports. And I will share this joke with you. Go. This, this joke is typical of the many jokes that circulate among Zimbabweans every time the European soccer season starts and or when major football competitions like the World Cup or Africa Cup of Nations um, begin. This story or joke, whichever way you want to interpret it, is about gender boundaries in leisure, leisure activities, especially in sport. What that joke is silent about is the fact that television spectatorship is, uh, women's television spectatorship in Zimbabwe is stereotypically restricted to movies. And football is uh, considered to be a men's sport in which women's fandom is gradually accommodated and where women who play the game are often masculinized. Uh, indeed, one of my male friends recently warned me against uh, loving football the way I do. I, I love football and I can't help it. <laughs> And his advice was, it was given in Shona, but I'll give you the English version. Do not love football so much. People will misconstrue that. I read this to mean that my friend felt that my love in football would be interpreted as me behaving like a man. So every time when I visit an uncle who stays in um, Nesbra is not here with us. Um, and if there is uh, some barbecue, you would see like he continues watching um, the soccer games. And then uh, the visitors, other visitors, ma male visitors would join him 
and then the women uh, find their space in the kitchen. And often I, I, I don't go to the kitchen. I want to watch football. So, yeah, but that, that, that would basically means that I, I prefer the company of men instead of joining other women and do cooking. But that's, that's shown a community for you. Before concluding this section, I would like to share an intriguing encounter from my recent field work that aligns with the concept of gender boundaries. One of my participants recounted the story about her aunt who was divorced for physically assaulting her husband. The husband's reasoning for seeking divorce was, I cannot live with another man in my house. And this anecdote implies that within a conventional heterosexual relationship, it is acceptable for a husband to be physically aggressive towards his wife, but not the other way around. This is not to imply that domestic violence is tolerated within Shona communities, but rather to highlight the societal perception that being abused by one's wife Crow and M cards is considered a source of shame for many Shona men, despite instances of such occurrences as evidenced in the aforementioned story. The tendency to dissociate men from what is deemed uh, to be women's behavior and vice versa does not, however, include what the Shona believe about the spirit realm. In Shona spirituality, for instance, women can serve as spirit mediums for their male ancestors. Just as males can be spirit mediums for their female ancestors. Spirit mediums in most cases speak and behave like the ancestors whose spirit inhabits them to cite uh, Togarase, Togarase 2017. Also in Shona culture, maternal uncles play unique roles that extends, ex maternal uncles play a unique role that extends beyond just being husbands to girls or women who call them uncle. They also take on the role of maternal figures for both boys and girls in a similar relationship. So in my reasoning, these cases of spirituality and social relations represent a few scenarios in Shona in which a man can be a woman. And these examples, I argue, uh, demonstrate well that the marginalization of women is largely social and does not always extend, it does not always, sometimes it does extend to the Shona indigenous religious beliefs. So drawing on my current project in the next part of my lecture, I discuss how unmarried, economically independent Shona women are perceived and how they disrupt the gender terrains of Shona families and heterosexual uh, marriages. And uh, I will begin by looking at marriage as success and singlehood as failure for Shona women. To begin with, among the Shona, for a person to be respected as a person, he or she must be married and have children. I am citing two of my uh, friends, Mnamat Chemuru and Dennis Masaga. I don't know if they managed to join online. So in such a community which places great value on heteronormativity, marriage normativity, and parent normativity, the single and childless person is essentially a marginalized other. Being single at a particular age is thus not a virtue among the Shona, even in death, 
an unmarried person used to be, to be treated differently. An adult male or female who died uh, childless, for example, used to be buried with a maize stake or a red or a tree bark. Uh, these items were presented as the child that the deceased could not have in real life. The explanation given for this is that this is done so that the deceased does not want the living, since it is believed that a person who dies childless is dies full of bitterness. The fact, however, is that this is more a mark of shame from my, my reading. For that reason, many individuals ensure that they would not die and be buried with these pseudo kids even if not everyone succeeded. So in such efforts to valorize the heterosexual coupling, there is uh, an implicit and sometimes explicit stigmatization of singlehood. Many women persevere as a result in broken, often un unhappy marriages as a result of uh, what Sheryl Yeland calls chains of moral and social prejudice that bind and cramp singlehood. In other words, for fear of becoming returned soldiers, and the phrase returned soldiers is uh, a Zimbabwean slang for fem <coughs> female divorces. Um, so for fear of becoming returned to soldiers, women suffer untold domains to stay married and for the same reasons some single women are expected to welcome any suitor that comes their way that can take them outside out of the so-called shame of singlehood this is aptly dramatized in a tiktok video that i won't uh, play unfortunately and uh, in that video, the TikToker prays, Dear God, give me anyone who wears some trousers to marry me, and my soul will rest. And the Shona version, Dai marimango ni pao chero ane trousers. Mwayangu wa Of late, um, being over 40, childless and unmarried, I have personally been getting the advice in Shona. Chingocha akachero chidara chaka figwa uite na chomana. And then the English version. Just find a widowed old man and they have a child with him. So, Chero Chidara, just any widowed old man, and Chero trousers, just any man, are there for some of the types of men that single Shona women are expected to aim for in desperation for getting, in desperation to get married. In my recent field work, I conducted an interview with a 42-year-old woman who had never been married. While she held hope for marriage, she did not display desperation to tie the knot with just any man. She recounted an incident where she rejected a potential suitor from a church, perceiving him as immature, and the type who would expect her to take care of him. Additionally, she expressed discomfort with the idea of dating divorcees, citing a lack of clarity regarding their past marital circumstances. And her final statement resonated with caution as she said, I'm old, but I still need to be careful. So to me, it became evident through conversations with this woman and others not mentioned here that in as much as the dominant perception is unmarried women are desperate, they should take what 
whatever comes their way uh, from conversations with this particular m woman and others um, not mentioned here, they did not exhibit a desperate attitude for settling for just any man. A very high premium is placed on marriage and having kids within it, as it is said, to bring many good things into the life of a woman. Sorry, I, I think I am flexed here. Yeah, I'm there. Um, so, yeah, I want to demonstrate this point through a video that I will play there. And uh, most parts of the video are in Shona, but I have provided a summary there that you can try to follow. Hans ye usamu jaidza muru mwako, endi watumu jaidza muru mwako yeye. Ano daro shawoma singu madha ni mari ten soja wa chitra kutu upuse, wako kuturira muru mwako shaka naka naka. <laughs> Unga uzwa unzu kupa muru mwako maso, kumisira mpura ugesira kumubikira kumpachika fshino zia kuitisa. Oh, <laughs> ya ano kuitira shingani. Vazinji venyu makatanga kurara pa mbeda warorwa. Vamwe kutonzi muro munu kupera manga munaro wa kuteta matama mfunge. Vamwe makabiswa kumamisha mka unzo wa masebabu za mama omu onas. Because of varume iwa wa mnonzi musa jaidze. Vamwe venyu tuwa natsanu ni tumaini ni tuwa kaindi swa kuma university na nabankuri. Iwa wa wa mnonzi musa jaidze. Itashu nudiwa umba kwako. Itashu nuda muro mwako. He's your king. Ndiye muna kaku chinjira life yeye. Do what he wants. Tukumwe tukuma advice. Atukua apply kumba kwako. Muno so sara paya mafuriru wa maini ya woto so na muna. Same person na ikufurira ye. Akutora murumu wako akita weku bere kanetauro. Akita weku pfuga mira. Achita kadezu kwa nufuga makupa kudoko. Achienda kwa hara. Achiti makadiko baba. He's your king. Mwitire. Shanoda. Um, I have tried to give a summary there, but it doesn't capture everything that is in that video. But uh, from this, we learn that uh, marriage is the potential to take women out of uh, a life of poverty is signified through how it removes foot cracks. Cracked feet, manga in Shona. It's is an apt symbol of poverty. It, all, it is also said to afford women the opportunity to sleep in a bed, to take the woman from a village to the city, to make a, a homeowner, and the woman's family benefits as well as seen in the example of the wife's siblings being sent to, to school. So this narrative is intended to convince women that marriage will grant them access to dignity, respect, and financial stability. In, t in return, they are expected to be wifeable. And key features of wifeability in this sense include being dependent, being subordinate, and submissive. In short, to use the words of the TikToker, understanding that one's husband is one's king. This reference to the husband as a king calls to mind the traditional way in which Shona may, women used to address their husbands as my king, Ishewangu. However, there's a way in which wives' endorsement of their husband's power in heterosexual marriages paradoxically speaks to their agency. They praise their husbands as kings to guarantee their material support. In social and uh, cultural texts, folk wisdom, social media, as well as uh, the social interactions of everyday life, the dominant narrative is that heterosexual marriage among the Shona is compulsory and is beneficial to the woman. And then coming to the question, why is one not married? In this part of the lecture, I want to highlight how the singlehood of 
women at a certain age is understood among the Shona. To begin with, uh, in Shona culture, there must be an explanation why one is not married. And one of the seemingly acceptable re reasons is religious. In the past, they used to be called, w they used to be women called Mbonga among the Shona, and these were virgins who did not marry for religious reasons. And then following the introduction of Christianity in Shona communities, when a girl, when a Catholic girl decides to be a nun, she remains unmarried for religious reasons. For what other reasons would an adult never marry? According to Pascal Mungwini, in traditional Shona cosmology, being an unmarried woman is something unusual to the extent that all sorts of accounts and stories are generated to explain this unnatural state of being. Possible explanations include that the unmarried woman is a spirit that repels potential suitors or simply is bad luck, or it is speculated that there could be an intergenerational case operating within the family. Sometimes it is also speculated that the unmarried woman's paternal grandmother's unsettled spirit prevents her from getting married, meaning anambuya. It is where something is said to be wrong in the spirit realm that unmarried women sometimes uh, consult are encouraged to consult or are taken to prophets or traditional healers by their relatives for healing. And in some cases, some rituals are performed to fix such uh, spiritual problems. In the field work that I carried out recently, I gathered uh, narratives from one of the participants that corroborate these arguments. And um, then story goes uh, from uh, a 30 year old female divorcee she said that this about a family one of our great grandfathers had a man from mozambique who worked for his family as payment he promised to give the man a wife for um, from amongst his daughters but he never did. Uh, the man died before the issue was resolved. This is the reason why daughters in our family are often divorced. So it, it, it would give an impression that this man who was denied a wife is now claiming what is due to, to him, but he is not claiming one wife, but many wives now. Besides the spiritual speculations about or explanations of singlehood, there are certain behavioral tendencies and social statuses that for Shona people render some women unmarriageable, or what I have termed in this lecture, unwifeable. In uh, the introduction to their recent book on uh, a radical African indigenous feminist principles and others indicate that she is a type of woman who is constantly labeled as not marriage type uh, especially in Zimbabwean social media so she is uh, a female whose totem is Mofu or Eland so she is labeled unwifeable for speaking a mind and especially because she always challenges men. And uh, Grace Msila in a self-reflexive essay entitled My Two Husbands, meanwhile considers the effects of education on women's wifeability. Msila remembers a grandfather's advice when she started uh, secondary school that her books should be her husband. She understood this advice to mean that she was supposed to be, to focus on her education and not be distracted by boys. But when she enrolled for a master's degree, the same grandfather had a different advice to give. And that's the advice, but who will marry you? Men in Shona patriarchy 
are socialized to become breadwinners and heads of their heterosexual families. So to be wife a a woman needs to normally let the men be the main breadwinner. Accordingly, when women can look after themselves, for instance, when they can have when they can afford to buy soap to remove cracks from their feet when they can afford uh, living in the city on their own, when they can take uh, their siblings through school, when they can build their own houses, basically when they are independent. Things that a husband should do for them in marriage, then they are dismissed as unwifeable. After all, it is believed women do not need to be educated to perform domestic roles prescribed for them in their families. In fact, being able to do domestic chores and not being educated is one of the critical features of wifeability among the Shona. Uh, this is uh, imagined explicitly in Tsitsidanga uh, Remba's magnum opus, Nervous Conditions, when Tambuzai um, expresses a desire to go to school, her father asks her, can you cook books to your husband? and feed them to your husband, stay at home with your mother, learn to cook and, and clean and grow vegetables. Cooking provides a facet fascinating space for reflections on gender and marriage in Shona families. The Shona slang for term for getting married is kukanda or kukandwa mkichen. Kukanda mkichen means that a man through marriage literally throws a woman into the kitchen. And on the other end, kukandwa kitchen means a woman is thrown into the kitchen through marriage. And cooking is also presented as a critical skill for women. Indeed, women who can cook and are ready to offer food are held in high esteem by their husbands, relatives, and friends. In some Shona communities, brides who lacked culinary skills, and especially those who could not uh, cook sadza, staple food for the Shona, properly used to be sent back to their parents to learn how to do so. And then uh, the unwifeability of successful unmarried women. In the last part of this lecture, uh, I want to nuance that concept of unwifeability. So, Owning a property, driving a car, and being financially stable can easily make a woman unwifeable among the Shona. Conservative suitors, for instance, would find problematic the fact that financial independent women would not consider marriage as a form of social security, where the husband serves as the main breadwinner. The process of finding a suitor is gendered among the Shona. The idea of courting Kunyenga naturalizes the main sea agents where the woman becomes the courted. Uh, and similarly, the concept of Kuwana or Kuwanikwa, finding and being found, which are the Shona terms for marriage, similarly reinforce the issue of gendered and even sexualized agents among the Shona. Uh, if a financially independent woman, especially a home owner, finds a suitor regardless, further questions may be posed. Where will the couple live, for instance? If the man does not have a place of his own, will they live at the house owned by the wife? That would, according to the Shona, disrupt the conception of heterosexual marriage that a woman leaves a family to join a husband's family and build a home. The expectation is the husband is the one who marries and seals this marriage by paying bride price. It also follows that when the woman is divorced, um, the husband will give a divorce token and a divorced woman takes that to a family as confirmation that a husband is indeed sent her away. This value of divorce signpost how it is uh, unimaginable in Shona patriarchy for a woman to leave her husband unless the husband divorces her. 
In a similar vein, it is often said that a married woman is with her husband. When she is divorced, people say she was retained by her husband. This gender logic of uh, heterosexual coupling and marriage is challenged if a man moves into a home owned by his wife. Such a situation is viewed with scorn as a scenario where a man is married by the wife. In English, that may not make a lot of sense, as when a man has been found. In such a scenario, the woman is wielded sexual agents. The arrangement is unthinkable. In a proper marriage, it is assumed that the woman has the responsibility to make her husband feel useful by becoming, becoming his dependent. This suggests that the role of such men in marriages is, is limited to the usual one of providing for their spouses. The problem of a woman owning a property or properties while she is single goes beyond uh, being a deterrence for potential suitors first. There is always speculation that whatever a single woman is, is acquired through the help of some random rich men. Also, the question of inheritance is, is always uh, raised. Now that you have properties but are childless, who will inherit them when you die? Or some might ask, why do you even they have properties in the first place. Is one of my own close relatives asked, people ask why you even go to work. What this basically means is that a single childless woman's life is conceptualized as being without substance. In essence, she cannot live for herself. It is my argument that materially empowered women with financial and cultural and social capital often take the position of agency which places them beyond the brackets of patriarchy uh, most women who raise their children outside marriages for instance are said that they play the dual role of mother and father to their children in conclusion, I know you are tired. By rigidly enforcing a binary view of uh, gender, Shona patriarchy seeks to maintain hierarchical distinctions between males and females and to sink into oblivion other genders. The symbolic reinforcement of gender stereotypes serves to further underline the subjugation of women in public and private spaces. As we navigate these gendered complex uh, dynamics with Shona culture, it is essential to recognize that challenging and deconstructing these norms is a crucial step towards fostering greater equality and respect among all members of society. The intersections of, gen of culture, gender, and power are not fixed, and by questioning and reshaping these paradigms, we can create a more inclusive and just future. The last note is on my reflections on singlehood. Although in this lecture I have spotlighted some of my personal experiences to reflect on the broader issues affecting women in singlehood in Shona communities, I'm quite aware of the fact that I speak from a specific personality of a privileged single woman from that position of privilege. It is not my intention to essentialize singlehood among the Shona or to suggest that all single Shona women are the same. Talking about singlehood in the singular, however, is strategic. While I do not leave the reality of single Shona women who are uneducated, are not formally employed, and do not own properties, I can at least relate to the broader challenges that relate to the stigmatization of singlehood among the Shona. Thank you so much for...